as we stand, let's pray. Lord God, we long to be those who understand all that you have to say in your words, who are able to accept it and who then live it out to your praise and glory. So please, as we come to your word now, would you enable us to do all of those things? And we ask for the honour of your name. Amen. Please do sit down. I absolutely love the TV programme called The Chase. Uh, any fellow chasers here? Yeah, one or two of us. I, I have to say, it is a fairly new thing for me. I walked into the living room a couple of months ago and one of my sons was watching it. Since then, I have been hooked. For me, this is quiz show bliss. And there is nothing more satisfying than knowing the answers to the questions when the contestants don't. I have to admit, sometimes that is not very difficult, particularly when it comes to questions on the Bible. Now, arguably, I have something of a head start on this one, uh, but a few weeks ago, the question was as follows. In the Bible, who was the mother of Jesus? Pass, said the panicked contestant. The genial host, Bradley Walsh, gave the answer. Mary, now you're feeling better already, aren't you? You knew that one. What about if the contestant had answered that question, those who hear God's word and put it into practice? Do you think Bradley would have okayed that one? I suspect not. But it's exactly what Jesus says in our second Bible reading from Luke 8. My mother and my brothers are those who hear God's word and put it into practice. That is why, in part, we talk about the church family. Because those who belong to Jesus, those who hear God's word and put it into practice, are part of his family. He describes us as his mother and brothers. Now, it is, of course, uh, Mother's Day today, or Mothering Sunday, if you're talking to my mother and one or two other people. And you may have thought, well, I know we're going through 1 Timothy in our morning services, Whatever are we doing, look at 1 Timothy 5 and 6 on Mother's Day. But actually, I want to suggest this is a great passage for us to look at on Mother's Day. It's a passage all about how we relate within the church family. I'll let you tell me at the end whether you think this works for Mother's Day or not. But please do turn uh, to 1 Timothy 5, which you'll find uh, in the church Bibles on page 1193, 1193. And 93, 1 Timothy chapter 5. We're looking at a long passage this morning, but actually verses 1 and 2 set up all that Paul goes on to say. Everything he says actually I think is an expansion of these first two verses. So let's look at them, chapter 5 and verse 1. Do not rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as if he were your father. Treat younger men as brothers older women as mothers and younger women as sisters with absolute purity. What Paul is saying to Timothy, one of the elders in the church at Ephesus, is that Timothy is to treat church members as family. And in the passage that we looked at last week, we saw that Paul tells Timothy, set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. So Paul's instructions to Timothy uh, are also applications for the whole church family. We've said before that 1 Timothy is a little bit like a postcard. It's addressed to Timothy, but Paul intends that the whole church family in Ephesus will be reading it as well. And he's saying here, treat one another as family. And how should we treat one another as family? The simple answer is, with honour, with honour. That's slightly masked by our translation, because in our passage we have the same word uh, in the Greek appear three times, uh, and rather annoyingly it's translated three different ways. Let me just show you where they are. Chapter 5, verse 3, give proper recognition to those widows who are really in need. That's literally give honour to those widows uh, in need. Chapter 5, verse 17, the elders who direct the affairs of the church are worthy of double honour. And chapter 6, verse 1, those who are under the yoke of slavery should consider their masters worthy of full respect. 
literally worthy of honor. This passage then is all about treating others within the church family with honor. And we've got uh, three headings to guide us through. Here's the first, honor those most in need. In chapter 5, verse 2, Timothy uh, is told by Paul, treat older women as mothers. And he then applies that in how widows in the church family are to be treated. You can see the connection, can't we? Mothers, widows. He says the same thing at the beginning and the end of the section, which kind of gives us a way that this is his main point. So chapter 5, verse 3, give proper recognition, proper uh, honor to those widows who are really in need. And then verse 16, if any woman who is a believer has widows in her family, she should help them and not let the church be burdened with them so that the church can help those widows who are really in need. Paul says the church must help those widows who are really in need. Now, uh, this section isn't the easiest read, is it? There may have been things which, as it was read you found strange or even upsetting. What does Paul mean by widows who are really in need? In the first instance, a widow in need is someone who has no family to help them. So verse 4, but if a widow has children or grandchildren, these should learn first of all to put their religion into practice by caring for their own family and so repaying their parents and grandparents for this is pleasing to God. For those of us who have elderly relatives, our first responsibility when it comes to caring is to them. Indeed, Paul spells it out in pretty stark terms. Verse 8, if anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for his immediate family, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Caring for elderly relatives isn't an add-on extra to the Christian faith for those who like that sort of thing. It is integral to being a Christian believer. I I want publicly this morning to honour those of you who do exactly this, who care for your elderly relatives. I I know that at times it can be very hard to do that, very unglamorous. At times, it is quite literally a thankless task. They don't thank you, and it feels as though no one else does. At times, it can be a considerable strain and pressure on you. But you are doing the right thing if you're caring for your mum or dad or grandparent or aunt. Actually, Mother's Day is a great day to say that. As you care for your elderly relative, you're doing what God wants you to do. And as a church family, we recognize you and praise you for it. The widow who is really in need, who the church should help, is the widow who has no family to help her. And secondly, who is a committed Christian. Verse 5. The widow who is really in need and left all alone puts her hope in God and continues to continues night and day to pray and to ask God for help. But the widow who lives for pleasure is dead even while she lives. Now, these are difficult verses, aren't they? These aren't saying uh, that a widow uh, has to sit around being miserable all day, denying themselves. Just look across one column to chapter 4 and verse 4, and we read this. Everything God created is good. Nothing's to be rejected if it's received with thanksgiving because it's consecrated by the word of God and prayer. Enjoyment is not wrong. Let me put that in the positive form. Enjoyment is right. Enjoyment is godly. But living for pleasure here has the sense of someone just living for herself rather than living for God. And that is wrong. So the church is to help those who are committed believers, who have shown through their lives their commitment to God. And that, I think, is what verses 9 and 10 are getting at. 
No widow may be put on the list of widows unless she's over 60. And here are some of the marks of consistent Christian discipleship. Has been faithful to her husband, is well known for her good deeds, such as bringing up children, showing hospitality, washing the feet of the saints, helping those in trouble, and devoting herself to all kinds of good deeds. Part of the difficulty of this passage is determining what's meant by uh, being put on the list of widows. Timothy clearly knew what Paul meant, so he didn't need explaining any further to him. It is, I think, slightly less obvious to us. It seems that Paul's talking about widows to whom the church was committed to supporting, uh, including, uh, and perhaps especially, supporting them financially. This was at a time, of course, where there was no social security, no state or widow's pensions, no carers coming in three or four times a a day. The widow uh, was literally, in verse 5, left all alone. She was just on her own. There was no support structure for her. And it was those widows, those with no family support, who were committed Christians, who Paul says are to be put on the list of widows who the church helped. And thirdly, it was to be older widows. Verse 11, as for younger widows, do not put them on such a list. Now, the verses that follow have a fair amount of controversy attached to them. Did, it's suggested, going on this list of widows entail some sort of commitment never to marry again, almost to be married to the church somehow? Well, you'll have people who say that, but in in the context of 1 Timothy, I want to suggest that would be pretty strange. Because in chapter 4, verse 3, forbidding people from marrying is, according to Paul, the teachings of hypocritical liars whose conscience of consciences have been seared with a hot iron. It's not massively positive about the whole don't get married teaching. So it'd be very strange if there was some sort of list with a, with a pledge that widows had to make in order to go on it. Uh, and uh, if you add to that with younger widows, in verse 14, Paul positively encourages them to marry. So, so what's, what's going on here? What, what's Paul getting at in these verses, verses 11 to 13. The overall issue is actually relatively clear. His concern is that widows will engage in behaviour that is inappropriate for Christians. And Paul is very keen for that not to happen. But what is the particular problem with them wanting to marry? 99.9% of our Bible translation is good and accurate and faithful and clear. There is just the odd instance where a word is translated in a way that actually doesn't make the meaning instantly clear to us. And I think something of that is going on in verse 12 with the word which for us has been translated pledge. It is the same word in the Greek pistis, if you're interested, that is normally translated not as pledge, but as faith. And that's quite important. It makes quite a significant difference. What's the issue that Paul is addressing here? I don't think that he's saying that by wanting to marry, they'll break some sort of pledge that they've made. I just don't think that's what's going on. The issue here is that he's worried that these younger widows will want to marry and by doing so be drawn away from Christ. So it's not wrong for widows to marry. He makes that clear. He wants younger widows to marry. But in verse 11, their sensual desires overcome their dedication to Christ. Verse 12, in following that route, they will be caused, he fears, to abandon their faith in Christ. Now, why does that mean that younger widows shouldn't be on this list of widows that the church supported? Because his fear is that they'll take all of the church... <coughs> excuse me, all of the church's financial support, but then turn their backs on Christ and so bring dishonour to his name. Paul is saying, no, it's only the widows in real need who the church is to help. The widows with no family, who are committed Christian, and who are older widows. Paul here gives 
at the age of 60, which would have been old in his, uh, in his day. 60 is just a young age these days. We, we know that. But clearly there is a figure somewhat higher than 60 uh, where a widow would fall into this sort of situation that Paul is outlining. Now, that's all very well for first century Ephesus. How does this apply to 21st century Salby? It's easy to get so caught up by the detail, and there's a lot of difficult detail in this passage, that we lose sight of the big picture. And actually, I think verse 16 sets out a really helpful summary for us. If any woman who is a believer has widows in her family, she should help them and not let the church be burdened with them, so that the church can help those widows who are really in need. Have you got elderly relatives, uh, those in real need in your own blood family? They are your first priority. Those in our church family who have no one to help them, as a church, we are to help. Now let me just pause for a moment here and, and say, as I've talked about church, what have you had in your mind? Uh, have you talked about them up there as they might be seen? So this is, this is the clergy's responsibility or, or the church wardens or the readers. This is what they should be doing. No, 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 no. Brothers and sisters, we are church. All of us who are trusting in Jesus are church. So what we have in this passage is what we should be doing. We should be committed to helping those most in need. And I do believe that we are. Our pastoral care team has helped dozens of people in recent years through providing lifts and meals and visits and practical help uh, of all different sorts to those most in need. We have as a church family a a small discretionary fund that enables us to provide uh, financial help to those uh, in real need, and we have done on several occasions in recent years. But it's maybe just worth saying that this isn't something that we just do for a season and then get bored of and find something else to do. Now, being church, being family, means that we help members of our church family most in need. Now, it might be, uh, as a result of this passage, uh, you want to do one of two things. It may be that actually you're aware of those in real need who you feel that we as church should be helping. Please, if that is the case, please alert me, others, to that. Or it may be that as a result of this, you just kind of feel your heart going a bit faster and thinking, actually, I want to be more involved in this, helping those in most need. That's that's totally where my heart is. And again, if that is you, maybe please just have a word with me at the end or, or get in contact over the next week or so. As a church family, we need to honor those most in need. I've got two more points that are much shorter than that one. Secondly, honour church elders. Uh, In verse 1, Paul says, do not rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as if he was your father. Now, the word for older man is very similar to the word for elder. Indeed, in Ephesus, the majority of elders would have been older men. The majority, but not all. Timothy himself was an elder and is described as being a young man. But just as widows were to be honoured, so too church elders are to be honoured. Verse 17, the elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honour, especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, do not muzzle the ox while it is treading out grain, and the worker deserves his wages. 1 Timothy, as a letter, has had a huge amount to say about church elders, so we're going to spend less time on these verses. We've said as we've gone through that in our context, elders equate most closely to clergy, vicars and curates. I wonder if you've ever heard it said uh, that the church would be better off without paid clergy, be better off uh, with uh, just church members using the gifts that God has given them, and not having uh, anybody set aside uh, and paid to do that. Now, I firmly believe in all church members serving within the church family, 
using the gifts that God gives to every one uh, of his family. I firmly believe in that. Uh, but God does set aside some to work in a paid capacity in the church, and that is thoroughly biblical from this passage and a handful of others like it. Paul is saying, look, set aside elders to lead and preach and teach and pay them for doing so. If you were to read in the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, do not muzzle the ox while it is treading out grain, you may not instantly have thought, oh, that means we should pay our church leaders. But that actually is how uh, Paul applies this. Here's, of course, a wonderfully flattering image to vicars uh, and curates that we resemble oxen stomping around, treading out grain. Uh, Paul also quotes from Luke chapter 10 here, which shows that already by the time 1 Timothy was written, Luke was part of the canon of Scripture, the teaching of the Lord Jesus, the worker deserves his wages. What does it mean in our context for elders to be honoured? Well, the Church of England does remunerate its ministers. I would argue from that, this passage that that is biblical. In this uh, benefice, clergy are honoured by work expenses being paid uh, both in full and promptly. Uh, I would continue uh, commend that continuing. I wonder if there is something about honouring church leaders in the way that we speak as well. I don't want to get on a, a high horse about this one, but comments about vicars being paid a lot for doing only one day's work uh, a week, I think it probably just falls outside what Paul has in mind uh, by honouring elders. Verse uh, 19, Do not entertain an accusation against an elder unless it's brought by two or three witnesses. Those who sin are to be rebuked publicly, so that the others may take warning. Church leaders is honoured by uh, paying them and, and by disciplining them. Paul is keen that elders aren't maligned on the testimony of just one person. Sadly, that can and has happened in church families. One person uh, has a particular axe to grind against a church leader, makes things up uh, about them. Uh, but Paul is also keen that where there has been serious sin, that that is dealt with. And because eldership is a public role, the rebuke of sin must also be public. It mustn't be covered over because someone's one of the boys or because everyone likes him. No, Timothy is urged there must be no favoritism in applying these instructions. Where there is ongoing sin, the elder must be disciplined. Thirdly, that means the decision to select, set someone aside for eldership is a weighty one and must not be rushed. They must be selected carefully. So verse 22, do not be hasty in the laying on of hands and do not share in the sins of others. Keep yourselves pure. The laying on of hands was how elders were set apart. Other elders would lay their hands on them. It's, I guess, the equivalent of our ordination. And we, when we looked at the requirements for a potential elder a few weeks ago in chapter 3, we saw that the first thing in the elder is character, Christian living. That is what is essential. Paul says uh, that an elder must not be a recent convert. And here he says that the laying on of hands must not be undertaken hastily, but after serious consideration of someone's character and lifestyle. Honour elders in paying them, in how they're disciplined, and in how they're selected. I think that just applies in a very straightforward way to us today. Thirdly and finally, honour bosses. We've seen how Paul applies the family relationship, so older women to widows, older men to elders. And the third that he mentions in, chapter, in verses 1 and 2, brothers, he then applies to employers in the workplace. Can we see that in chapter 6 and verse 2? Those who have believing masters are not to show less respect for them because they are brothers. Now, his teaching here is about how Christian slaves are to relate to their masters. So verse 1, all who are under the yoke of slavery should consider their masters worthy of full respect so that God's name and our teaching may not be slandered. There is no exact equivalent to first century slavery. 
very different first century slavery from the horrors of the 18th and 19th century American slave trade. But equally, it is different from the 21st century workplace as well. Slaves normally were treated pretty well by their masters, but they were still owned by their masters. As Paul puts it in verse 1, they were under the yoke of slavery. But Christian slaves were to honour their masters. Why? Well, end of verse 1, so that God's name and our teaching, that is the teaching about Jesus Christ, may not be slandered. Now, the application isn't exact, but there is an application, I think, to Christians operating in the workplace, which is many of us here. If you have an employer, a boss, you are to honour them. Each of us who trust in Jesus Christ is a walking advert for him. And in your workplace, you will be an advert for Jesus Christ. People will either think better of him because of how you conduct yourself, or they will think worse of him if you are an, a bad advert to him. So for those of you in the workplace, let me ask you a very simple question. What sort of advert for Jesus are you? Are you a good advert or a bad advert? If you have the considerable benefit of working for a Christian, well, verse 2 tells us that you should honour them just as much, even better, because you're working for a brother or a sister. So three sets of relationships that are to be lived out by Christian believers. Uh, it leaves us, I think, with two questions uh, as a church family and one for us as individuals within it. Questions for us as a church family. Do we honour those most in need? Is there more that we need to do? Do we honour church leaders? And for those who work, do you honour your boss in how you relate to them? Let me pray for us. Lord God, we long to be obedient to you in all of our relationships and in every area of our lives. In these three that we've thought about from your word this morning, we pray for your help as a church family and as individuals, that we should show honour where you call it to be shown and that through all our dealings it may bring honour and glory to you. For we ask in the name of Jesus.